Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Local Chat. You weren't expecting me to nail it on the first try, but I did. Joining us today, he believes the Earth is as flat as his face. It's Ian Gibson. Look, all I'm saying is the laser calibrated gyroscopes are wrong. That's all I'm saying. They're okay? wrong. Also joining us today is the man who likes to wear hats, Kyle Bailey. I do. Beanies are stupid. I'm wearing this one ironically. <laughs> We love wearing <laughs> things ironically, like my thong. Anyways, folks, today we are here and we're live and we're talking about video game news. Some of the highlights we'll be hitting today is Blizzard, is James Bond, and is Stonks. But until then, first, I like we like to get mellow. We like to, you know, relax. And we talk about what we have been graphic playing. What you playing today? Instead of starting with one of the three of us, I'll start with one of the one of us. Kyle, what have you been playing? Been playing a lot. Um, Cyberpunk 2077 got a new patch. As far as I can tell, it didn't really do anything. Um, but I checked it out for like a good two hours, and it was it was still Cyberpunk. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Half-Life Alex a little bit. My buddy is uh, letting me borrow his old uh, Oculus, his original Oculus. I've been playing a little bit of that. Ooh. Very cool. Very cool. And then just, you know, here and there, random other games. Red Dead 2, I always go to check out just because there's always something to find. Um, a few other things. I think Halo MCC, I played some multiplayer for the first time in a really long time. Actually with Johannes, one of the subjects <gasps> of our lovely uh, isolation Johannes. game jam. I love Johannes. For his for his birthday, it was, it was fantastic. Nice. And then uh, I've been playing some Hades because it's super fun and just a great game. Real good. I need. Yeah, I definitely tough. need to get into Hades. Okay. Um, I just want to target in a little bit. Half Life, Alex. What What are you playing on again? Oculus. Yeah. So the original Oculus. Original Oculus, yeah. which Wait, is from the Rift. The Rift. Yeah, the Rift one. Okay. Yeah. Because they had what do they call it? DK one is the development kit one. That yeah. Released before the Rift. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not it, the original public release. I should say the gotcha. normal. Okay. I knew a kid how, in college. How are you liking Alex? Um, it's fun. I'm not very far into it because honestly, I can only do like an hour to an hour and a half max before I'm like, I have to get the headset off. Um, I don't yeah. get dizzy. I just get like a headache. I get like migraines. Um, so yeah. I do normally like an hour to an hour and a half is my limit. So um, I try to do that once every few days. So I'm like six, seven hours into it a little bit. And it's very mm -hmm. creepy. I like it a lot. Um, it is very different than a Half-Life game, but also has a lot of mm. things like callbacks and, and just the way that it's designed is very valve -y, very Half-Life-y, um, which is always, you know, a welcome thing to experience, especially after the long drought that we've had with, you know, most, well, yeah. any game from Valve. So it's it's been it's been a real treat to play and uh, I like it so far. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that was the thing that that really grabbed me with Half-Life Alex and shocked me the most as as non-shocking as it is to say it it's a half-life game like it is the half-life world it is city 17 all the assets are there the the, the musical cues the ui it is a half-life game and that was kind of like the most shocking thing to me was as soon as you start boot up that game and you hop in you're just like it's city 17 man i'm back here it's crazy yeah. And it, it was um, it's it's weirdly like comforting to be because City Seventeen is such a horrible place to be. Like if you yeah. actually live there, it's like oh my god, this is terrible. Um, but it was like oddly comforting to go back to a setting that I know I I remembered so fondly before, and it was nice to be able to to have new things to do there, um, even if it was technically before the things that I did before. But yeah, lots of fun. I'm curious. Which um which movement style are you doing teleportation? Are you doing the, the analog movement stick? Yeah, so I'm I'm sticking with the um look and teleport, and then the the right thumb stick is the sort of quarter turn. Okay, um, yeah. Which, which they said was default, so I just left it. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't really tried the other stuff with. I'm I have this area around me, sort of my VR space. So I have a pretty decent size play space. Um. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one thing I was worried about was that I wouldn't feel like I could move, but I actually can move, you know, three, four steps is, is more than enough to, to manage in that yeah. game. Um, but I haven't tried any of the actual, like, you know, moving with, with the, the, the normal controllers, like you, you would on an Xbox controller. I haven't tried that at all just because I, I think that it would make me feel weird. Like it would just, it, it just, yeah. I don't know, yeah. something, something about the way that they have the, 
the settings tweaked for the default teleportation just feels good. And what, you know, it takes you five minutes, but they have more than enough time to give you that tutorial and to sort of ease you into it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the reasons why I've stuck with it is because it's, it's as easy as it is to pick up a normal controller as it is to just learn that right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I, I wanted to do the analog stuff. I never really enjoyed teleportation, not just in Half Life and Alex, but in other games. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of forced myself to get used to the analog stick movement. And it was definitely like, to start with, it was like 30 minutes and then I would start to feel motion sick. Yeah. But over a couple of weeks, I got to a point where I can probably play for like 90 minutes to two hours now and be fine. Um, there's definitely still stuff that freaks me out. I think one of them happened on a stream that Will and I were on. <laughs> where I was playing in a game and basically it was a multiplayer server and they had a whole bunch of mini games. And one of the mini games was called falling and oh. I clicked into it and you're just falling. And I immediately had to like close my eyes because your stomach drops out of you. So is, there, <laughs> is that, is that that game? I, I, it could be a completely different game, but I've seen little like promos for, for Oculus's, you know, mm -hmm. massive library of, of things that you can do. And there's one where it's like, you're walking on like a wooden plank between two oh. buildings or something like that. And it's no, like so this, yeah, that's that's called Plank or the Plank, okay. I think. Um, no, this was part of Pavlov VR, which is basically like it's like Gary's Mod and Counter Strike rolled into one mm -hmm. as an FPS VR game with a whole bunch of community servers doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but now that you have a headset, you should absolutely try out Pavlov VR. It is fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, no, I was just about to ask. I'm curious if you have other VR games lined up now that you have you know, access to a headset that you want to try out. Yeah. So I had the the very first VR game that I ever tried um, way back when, you know, the Oculus Rift first came out um, that I was at my friend's house to try was um, Super Hot, which was so much fun. And it's, it's a perfect game for VR because it's super easy and um, it's just designed really well for that space. So I definitely want to pick that back up and, and go through the entire VR experience again. Um, Definitely have to try. I mean, if, if the Pavlov's thing is like Gary's mod, I definitely want to try out. I'm sure there's a bunch of things in there that are really, really unique. But I honestly, it's like having a new console for me because I, I haven't ever had access to it at home before. Yeah. So I'm, there's a there's a whole library of things that I know I need to explore. But once once I beat Half-Life Alex or get too scared and put it down, uh, I will try something else. Yeah. 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 It's it's I, I, I keep thinking I need to go back to VR. Right now I play it maybe once every two, three months just because even though I have my headset right here, it's always just such a hassle to like, I, I have to plug it into the back of my computer. And because I already have four monitors, I have to unplug one of them. <laughs> and then there's there's always like wonky issues with drivers, the Oculus app not starting properly or the cable in the headset coming loose. And it's just like, it, it's always, it's not like playing a game where you're just like Steam launch game. There's always an extra level of hassle, not just hardware, but also dealing with Oculus software. And I feel like I almost want to get a Quest 2 just to get rid of a lot of that plug-in in hardware, but I I I don't play enough VR games to do it. So I it's was like, I was really lucky with the fact. I mean, I know that like you you your setup is is massive, and you've got a ton of stuff peripherals plugged into the back of your computer. I was really lucky in that I had um, a USB three like extender plugged into a PCIe slot, um, so yeah. I had more than enough ports to just leave them plugged in. And I had a little, um, pri prior to getting the headset, I had my headphone little holder underneath my uh, desk. So I literally just hang the headset right on that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's sort of just ready to go. So I haven't really yeah. encountered anything as, as difficult as that. But yeah, it, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine if it was that much of a hassle to set it up every time. I'd, I definitely wouldn't touch it as much as I, I you know, yeah. have, have felt the need to lately. Yeah, and you still have to use the... They're not called lighthouses. I've got Oculus calls them, but the the yeah. Center. So I've got those. There's one right there, and then there's one here and one there. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, three three point setup or whatever it is. Um, the calibration was a little wonky, but once I got it down, I haven't had any issues with tracking. So it's been oh, that's pretty cool. solid. Yeah, that's good. I feel like yeah, that's it's, the, it's always like, the biggest issue. Yeah, people keep asking about VR, and it's like. The Quest 2 is by far the closest they have ever come to it being a good buy, but it's still just like, I don't quite think there's enough must-play games to warrant even the $300 price tag. Yeah, it's yeah. close. I would say it's at like $200. So if you can find yourself a Quest 2 for $200 or even a Rift S, hop on it. But other than that, I can't quite, doesn't matter what headset you're getting, I wouldn't spend more than 200 bucks on it. 
You yeah. heard it here, folks. We are selling Quest 2s for $200. We're buying them for 300 so we're actually at a loss here. Um, oh, no. That's great. Uh, Kyle, before uh, we move on to what Ian's been playing, my other question for you is how how's the Cyberpunk patch? Um inconsequential i guess i'm certain <laughs> i'm certain it fixed some things um again when we talked about this last time uh my experience with cyberpunk what was mostly you know crash free like i didn't really have any hard crashes that brought me back to the desktop it was just glitches and they're still there you know some of the systems are still vastly inferior to other games that have been put out um in the same space and it, it, it just still felt like the the first time booting it up really it didn't really feel any different Oof. um mm. i i haven't played it on consoles at all so it it might have been and i'm under the impression that that main patch was more for consoles than it was for pc gotcha. um so i'm i'm actually curious to see if, if you guys have been playing um or or trying it again on the consoles if you noticed any sort of a difference no god no i'm done with it <laughs> yeah i uninstalled <laughs> it <laughs> um great that's awesome i uh yeah that game is yeah disgusting it's a game it's a game it came out it's a game um ian what have you been playing i okay i i I don't know if i talked about this on local chat but i I definitely talked about on the stream i feel like i went through a period do you guys ever have those periods where you just you either don't want to play video games or you want to play video games but you can't find any game that holds you for more than 10 minutes so you just end up not playing games for a while yes um Mm -hmm. i feel like that was me up until the end of december and then I got back into games a bit. And this past week has been nothing but gaming. I was trying to crunch some numbers. And I swear I've done in the last week, I, 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 I want to say like 30, 30, 30, 35 hours of game. Wow. wow. It's a lot of gaming. <laughs> and Jeez. I didn't even intend to. And I'm not the type of person that normally games that much. But anyways, I've been playing a bunch of games. I played uh, Space Plan which is uh, an incremental uh, uh, mobile game recommended by uh, Jake last week. It was pretty fun. It, it wasn't, I wasn't too crazy about the incremental clicker mechanics in it. I don't think there's anything crazy about it. But it did actually have a story, which was pretty cool to have a story in a clicker game that has like some small cutscenes and stuff. And I actually liked the story. And it was kind of weird to have a story. And it, it, it's kind of like... Um, like I think about Hades and how they're doing some interesting stuff to the genre they're in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like space plan did that as well with it's um, by adding the story to a clicker. And it was like, just crazy. Did you Um, try um, a dark room yet? I I started it on a browser and then I stopped after a minute. Cause I was like, I'm not in a good space for this. Gotcha. So I may, I may try it eventually. I wonder if it's on mobile. Cause it is. I have the app. Okay, good. But the other thing is, for clickers, I really like them to literally be like a clicker idle game, and I feel like a dark room is like, yeah, I sit down and I like binge it. Yeah, know? I usually I, I like binge it like working, but like you stop Got and it. like do a bunch of that. Actually, it'd be good while you're waiting for uh, uh, technology to research. That's a good point. Um, another game that I played just came out on G- Xbox Game Pass is Donut County by Ben Esposito. This came out like what, 2 years ago or something like that. Yeah. Um uh, basically it's kind of like a Katamari type game where you have you are a hole in the ground and you're moving the hole around on the ground and dropping things into the hole and then your hole grows bigger and you can drop bigger things into the hole. Uh it's a very cutesy indie game. You guys played um Donut County? No, never heard of it. Uh Karen played it uh on her iPad during we went vacation somewhere. I think it might have been Utah. And then I downloaded it on Game Pass uh, on PC as well. And I've played maybe 20, 30 minutes of it. Okay. Yeah. I I had high hopes for that game. It seemed like it got a lot of praise. And I'm honestly a little disappointed. It um, The game only took me like two hours to beat. But I swear there's maybe 25 minutes of gameplay total in that yeah. game. Yeah. Like it's it's weird. Like it has like a lot. Of, I love the art style. I love the humor in it. I really like the writing. But it's like they put so much effort into these cutscenes and the art style and everything that they forgot to put in the gameplay. So basically, each level takes like ninety seconds to three minutes to complete. Yeah. And there's twenty levels in the game. So it's like 
it's less puzzly than I want it. To. Like it's the it's yeah, yeah, the promise of Katamari with a good story, but they didn't make it as long as like a Katamari or as challenging. Yeah. Plus, plus like every level, the first half of every level is the same. It's you are a small hole, and you're you're dropping things in. And like you said, it's there's there are some puzzles, but it's very less puzzly. Like I feel like with Katamari you're rolling around and you're trying to figure out, okay, I got to do small objects. So I'm not ready for that object yet. Okay. Now let yeah. me go back to that object and you're trying to keep your momentum going, et cetera. But with this one, it's just like, okay, I'm a small hole. I'll pick up the trash. Okay. Now there's two camp chairs. I'll pick up the camp chairs. Like it's, it's almost linear. Yeah. It's more, it's more about, yeah. It's definitely more about the story of the hole than what the hole yeah. is doing. Um, and it's, it's honestly disappointing. I feel like they completely knocked it out of the park with the writing, the story, the style, et cetera. But they, it, there just should have been a lot more gameplay and a lot more mechanical depth to it. I don't yeah. think it would have been too difficult to do that. They have the bare bones structure of it. It's just not there. So it, it's a good Game Pass play, but uh, kind of disappointed by it. Um, been playing more Hitman 3. I finished one more level. I think I have one level left. I'm kind of slowing down. I, I think I may be, nothing against Hitman 3, but I think I may be Hitmaned out. Because I played a lot of one, I played a lot of two. How how has your progress come along, Will? Uh, it's going good. I I actually dropped it for not dropped it, but I've stopped playing it for another game on my list. But uh, I I enjoyed it. I I really thought we touched on this last week. I thought what they did with the Berlin level was really cool. Um, mm -hmm. and even like when we talked about it last week, I only done the very beginning of it. And once you get into that mission, like the way they reveal who your targets are or anything, they like do a great like yes. spin on that. And I really enjoyed that. And then the level after that is the Chong the China one. Chongqing. Something like that. I'm not China. gonna try to pronounce it. It starts with a CH. I know that much. Uh I'm trying to remember it and mispronounce it at the same time. Um <laughs> So oh. that level was pretty cool because I did like a whole thing in it and I was like, oh yeah, this seems a little small. And then I like looked where the other target was and I was like, oh, that's a completely different area. So then I had to yeah. like go over and do that. And there were a couple, I feel like I had a couple issues um, stumbling into missions and mm -hmm. it not being it. But then it, it, in both situations, I thought it had broken and then it just quickly adapts to starting halfway through a story mission oh, really? in, in a, in a neat way that I didn't think it would do. Uh, and mm -hmm. even me killing a person in the middle of one switched to another one. It was like oh. kind of worked out in that sense. And uh, I think it played it, played it pretty well. So I, I'm enjoying it. I just, I haven't been back to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely going to go back. Um, I'm just not sure I'm going to play it too much after I've kind of made mine the story. I, there, there is something that's very, there's something that's bothering me a lot with hitman 3 what is it the game is beautiful it's gorgeous it runs 4k 60 hdr on the series x it's fantastic the cutscenes i feel like are 720p and were created on a ps3 <laughs> dev kit yes. like the the animation is literally different and the characters are different so they're like you know it's it's like it's older animation it's older characters looking and it's like horribly compressed and rendered at a lower resolution it's like What's going on it's, here? It's so it's kind of like night long. It's like yes, so weird. Like, the way they walk is like slightly robotic. Yeah, and I like. I mean, it's so. I don't know what happened because the first one had really good cutscenes. The second one mm -hmm. is when they split off and were on their own. So you're like, you gave them a pass for making like the picture cutscenes, and you were like, yes. okay, it's okay. And then they're back for this one, and I feel like they still haven't put enough pumped enough money into the cutscene department. As much as they're yeah. tackling story. And I feel like that's the case of they're like, we're going to tackle the story in the game. And then last minute, they're like, we should make cutscenes. Yeah. So, yeah. We, we need a way to link everything together. So we'll just do this half ass thing. It's actually yeah. weird that you say that because there's another game from what well, it's the original Mirror's Edge um, mm -hmm. had re for the time and still does have gorgeous graphics. I mean, like the textures in the game, the, the first person, like it looks really good. But then the cutscenes are all that if you remember from like eight to 10 years ago, progressive had those weirdly like faux animated commercials. It's like yeah. that. And it's like, it's why, lady. why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just use the the game engine to, to do the, yeah. like, yeah. I don't understand. 
Um, it was just a weird, like maybe it was a stylistic choice. Maybe it was a budgetary thing. You know, they just needed something quick and dirty. Um, but it's it's funny that a, a game as big as Hitman 3 is is sort of lacking in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Those um, um those e trade commercials, I believe, were yeah. shut down because of Rule Thirty Four of that <laughs> cartoon lady, <laughs> of which course. is my favorite of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's just like it's yeah. It's 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 just weird because the game looks great, and then you get these cutscenes, and you're just like, what's going on here, guys? Um, the next game I want to talk about, I'll talk about it briefly, just because we had a fantastic stream on Tuesday. Dyson Sphere program Will's upset for a reason I'd rather not talk about on stream, but let's just say that I started playing this game around 5 p.m. on Monday, and I recently hit 15 hours on that save um, because this game, it's factorial, baby. The crack is back, and it's still whack because can't stop playing it. Um, it's basically factorio, but on a 3D sphere and you can move between planets and between solar systems. They've added some tech on it. They've made some small changes, but really it's just a take on Factorio. It has a lot more in common with Factorio than it doesn't. Um, but it's pretty exciting. I would say if you're interested in that, go watch our stream archive um, from Tuesday's stream where we, we just kind of have a nice time going through the differences and just hanging out and playing the game. Final game I want to talk about, folks. <sighs> Boys, I did it. I did it i racing the 24 hours of daytona team endurance race was last friday evening and boys it was a lot a <laughs> lot of racing um so i just want to take you through a story real quick endurance racing is all about how many laps you can do in 24 hours. I thought you were going to say endurance. <laughs> no, I was almost, but it really is. So it's like, it's like sometimes you're like, it's not necessarily about passing the guy in front of you. It's not even necessarily about going faster than the guy in front of you. It's just about not crashing, not slowing down. It's about pitting as few times as possible. It's all about consistency and pace and just making it to 24 hours because I was on a four person team and that's an average of six hours driving per person over a 24 hour period. And it's just a lot of like focus and concentration. Um, so let's just say that three hours into the race, a little bit into my first stint, we, we had some accidents, we had some crashes. And the thing about iRacing is that it's realistic. So if you crash and you take damage, you can end up having to be towed to the pits and then sit in the pits for repairs. And there were cars dropping out of the race on lap two because they ended up in an accident and got so much damage that it was like four hours of repairs and they just quit the race. Oh, wow. Rather than continue. So they take it pretty seriously. So it's not like you can bump other cars and mess around like that. Like you're going to get penalty points. You're going to get damage. You're going to have to take repairs. So anyways, like 30 minutes into my first stint, it's like midnight Eastern time, midnight for me as well. And some guy punts into the back of me and spins me and I take some damage. I'm like, oh, okay. So I go into the pits. It's like 40 seconds worth of repairs. We probably lose like two minutes total in time. I'm like, okay, it's fine. I get back out there and we end up going like an hour later at 1 a.m. in the morning. I end up going three wide with a pack of four cars at 200 miles per hour on the oval. And I'm passing somebody and I'm like two feet from the wall and the net code glitches and me and the car next to us get sucked into each other. And then I get slammed into the wall. <laughs> what? And immediately I'm like, oh no. Cause the steering wheel, like I have force feedback on my steering wheel and it's just like, <laughs> and basically my, the, we, the steering got knocked like 15 degrees off and we were like 10 miles per hour slower at our top speed. And Daytona is a lot of top speed driving. So we go in the pits. I take like a minute of repairs we go back out and we're still wonky and we're basically like five seconds slower per lap. Wow. And I drive for another like 90 minutes like that. And the whole time I'm talking to my teammates and I'm like, it's drivable, but the whole time you have to hold the steering wheel, like 15 degrees to the left, <laughs> you got to be careful when you turn right because it wants to keep turning right. And we're slow. And they're like, okay. And it was like one guy had taken his shift. I'd taken my shift. Nobody else had driven yet. And they were like, okay, well let's just keep going for now. And if it's really, really bad, then we'll just give up at some point. Cause basically the whole time we're getting passed by people. Yeah. Um, 
and we drop down to like 20 or 25th or something like that. So I go to sleep at 2.30 in the morning after driving for three hours, basically. And I wake up in the morning and I'm like a little depressed. I'm like, I did my stint and it wasn't my fault, but I had two crashes and just screwed the car, basically. <laughs> and I wake up and I start to do my, my next three hour shift and I get on and, and they're driving and they're like in 14th. And then I get in the car and the car's fine. Like it's fixed. <laughs> There's no damage to it anymore. And I'm like, guys, what did you do to the car? Like, like we took the repairs, but they couldn't repair more. And they're like, oh, somebody slammed into us in the middle of the night. And when we got repaired, it fixed all of the damage. <laughs> <laughs> and That's I was like, incredible. I was like, boys, we're back in the race. So long story short, we drove the wheels off that thing. And we ended up finishing in seventh place. Wow. There were 55 cars total, 20 cars in our class, which is the fastest class. And we finished seventh. It was a lot of fun. I have some stats here just to round it out. Um, Will, let's start with you. How many laps do you think I drove in my driving during the 24 hours? Not the whole 24 hours, just my laps driven. 282. Close. 258 laps. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, out of the 24 hours, how much driving did I do? You said you had to do an average of six. I'll say seven hours and 45 minutes. Close. I did seven hours and 20 minutes. Okay. Um, the schedule kind of shifted a little bit. Plus, I had to do longer driving while I was slow. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of why I did the most out of everybody. Total distance. Last one. What's the total distance that I drove? Will. 800 miles. 918 miles. <laughs> We're all relatively close. I'm <laughs> yeah. Ball proud of our guesses. <laughs> so um, I, I know I talk about iRacing a lot on this just because we started this podcast while I was training for this event. But crazy event. Um, we had like five teams. And we finished seventh, another team finished 14th, and three other teams crashed out and didn't finish their race. So we actually did really well. One last tidbit was we noticed when we started the race that in the race with us, not in our class, but in one of the teams that was on the track with us, and somebody that I passed several times as part of the race was a NASCAR driver, like a real life NASCAR driver. Jeff Gordon? (laughs) <laughs> no, no. So it was it was some guy who drives a NASCAR, but he drives an iRacing for fun. And because in iRacing, you have to use your real name. They were like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. And that's his like esports team. And it was like, cool. <laughs> that's pretty uh, slammed into him. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so between, you know, seven and a half hours of iRacing, 15 hours in Dyson Sphere, starting and beating Space Play in the Donut County and playing Hitman 3, I had a very very productive and surprisingly long gaming week probably the most gaming i've ever done in any week in my life it's That's just a awesome. uh, good start to the year Let's That's that crazy way. yeah well um okay i'll try to be quick so we can get to the news uh what have i been playing hitman 3 you already talked about uh chrono trigger i started my very first jrpg you can tune in on mondays at 5 p.m I want your reaction right now real quick give it to me how's it going so far how's your jrp G experience. I love Chrono Trigger. It's so good. Uh, it's a very good game. I'm having a great time. My main character, Horse, his best friend, C3PO, his love interest, Sweat, and uh, the frogman, Tongu. Uh, we get to name them, so we had a good time. Uh, Sweat. <laughs> Sweat's the best. Um, so we're, I'm having a blast with it. Chris is good because uh, he's got the guide and he doesn't remember as much. So it's it's kind of nice playing that way. Um, so yeah, Monday's five p.m. To, how much are you having to rely on the guide? Uh, not much at all. Uh, he'll occasionally guide me, but it's pretty much like uh, I'm pretty much finding the way. Uh, combat's cool. It's like active combat, and it's very stressful because if you don't choose, I'm used to like I've played a decent amount oh, of Pokemon yeah. where I'm, like choosing the things. So in this one, your like little bar fills up, then you get to attack. And then mm-hmm. if the other guy's bar fills up, what's but if they fill up while you're waiting to attack, they'll just keep attacking you. It's very stressful. Um but yeah, I'm having blast. 
Um, I hate timed menus. Like if I'm in a menu, everything stops. Yeah, everything stops. Please. So you can I change to that. Um, oh. But this is one of the first games that had that system, so it was very novel at the time. Um, gotcha. So yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm really enjoying that. The archives go up on YouTube if you want to check that out. Uh, right now, Mondays, 5 p.m. Might be Monday, Wednesdays, just because I kind of want to get through it because it's fun. Um, also, I have been playing Last of Us Part 2. Uh, I had a $20 GameStop gift card that came with my PS5 and... Mm. I think it was on sale or I was like, oh, you know, I'll just grab Last of Us Part 2. Um, it is the most beautiful game I've ever played uh, visually. It is gorgeous. It Karen walked in the room and thought I was watching a movie, um, <laughs> which you could argue. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. I was actually thinking about this for this discussion. I think Naughty Dog games are the halfway point between video games and until dawn uh yeah i could see that i could see that and then next to until dawn is movies um I, i'm having a blast it's a beautiful game it's a very dark game uh both literally and uh physically and story-wise uh it's but it's oh, it's just it's so packed with beautifulness it's just so pretty it's crazy uh mm -hmm. and i'm really enjoying it I like Last of Us stealth and all that sort of stuff. So it's a good time. Uh, I'm also a huge sucker for post-apocalyptic, uh, like, uh, like overgrown highways and stuff with like trees and stuff. I love that stuff. Um, How's the yeah. music? Music. Oh, my. Music's so good. There's also, so I forgot. Karen's like, when does this game take place? I'm like, I think it's like 2019, whatever. Because the, the event is in 2013. And it is like i think it's like the 2050s or 2060s i forgot there's a time gap in the first game when joel's daughter dies in the very beginning and then it's like 20 or 30 years later in boston and i forgot about that so it's like i want to say it's 40 to 50 years uh, i can't really remember but at one point uh ellie knows the guitar and she plays take on me but like in like an yeah, acoustic way thing. and was i was like, like came out yeah, I was like, this is weird, but I guess if Joel knew it and taught her guitar, and she probably hasn't heard it necessarily, because they might not have the like record of it or the CD, um, like it could be a real thing. And yeah. like she should really be playing like futuristic techno. Yeah, exactly. And they have a really cool like guitar mechanic where you like somewhat play the guitar. Um anyways, it's really yeah, good. Like, it's like a rusty turntable and she starts yeah. to like <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a couple stuff in there where i'm like uh you're kind of forcing the story on this one or i know exactly where this is going but mm -hmm. oh neil Druckmann. uh so that's been fun last of us part two uh moving on uh this is a tie into the news the other game i've been playing is a mobile game i like to call robin hood which is investing in the stock market stock market <laughs> um oh if any if you've been paying attention all this week you know that there's a revolution going on where revolution? the the hedge funders are saying hey stop exploiting the market like we do and the people are saying no um yeah so it's kind of like um you, you ever see that kids and uh, not kids and all but why does kids you know uh sketch about race war where you just like like there's a guy yelling out the window and he opens the window and he goes hey what's up and he goes Race war. It's race <laughs> war. It's like the same thing about people going class war. Come buy stocks. Class war. And it's like, okay. <laughs> it's so uh, my buddy Chris, friend of the podcast, Chris, and uh, also George and I got into Robin Hood to just invest because we work for a sports betting company and we don't really consume sports. And we're like, why bother sports betting? Even though we get the best advice on the planet when we can not get any advice and just invest in the stock market. <laughs> um so we started doing that, and then this GameStop stuff happened. So we bought GameStop just out of the blue for some reason. I can't remember why. So we got it, like, I think my average was 38 bucks a share. And so wow. I, so we got those, and then this big thing happened. Um, so I don't actually know how it got started. It was Wall Street's Bets on Reddit. Um, they... So let me let me just say I I saw 
there's an investigative journalist doing a, an article on it and they tweeted before, I don't think the article's out yet, but they tweeted some of the research. Basically, there's a guy, September of 2019, there's a guy who basically started this strategy. And long story short, it's that uh, GameStop, the stock likes to be shorted by a lot of hedge funds, et cetera. But when this guy looked into the public financial earnings of GameStop, he realized that the stock is way undervalued. Like it was sitting at four or five dollars a share when it really should be up at like, you know, anywhere between like 100 to 200 as a realistic stock value. So so long story short is basically these hedge funds keep betting against GameStop and shorting it and deliberately keeping the stock low. And Redditors have realized that they can band together and buy these stocks. And by buying it, they're going to force the shorters to buy more stocks and essentially call it was that a gamma squeeze, which is basically yeah. where the price of the stock skyrockets because people are buying it to make more money. And then the people who are trying to short it have to buy it to yes. make, to lose less money. So long story short, it's hedge funds versus Reddit, all because of this guy's strategy that he developed back in September of 2019, which is crazy. And the hedge funds so far have lost $90 billion this yep. month yep. alone. Yep. Uh, the company uh, my no, Chris's uh, girlfriend works for, uh, she's not part of the, any of the stock trading stuff, but okay. her company had to bail them out, the Melvin <laughs> Capital, before oh, the wow. dirt, after the first squeeze, and now the second squeeze yeah. happened. This all culminated, we're not really going to get into this too much, this all culminated into Robinhood today stopping the trade of the stock, and they're now being investigated for... Uh, Pretty much breaking the law, um, yeah. colluding because yeah, yeah, Citadel supposedly contacted them to tell them to stop it because they were trying to short again. It's basically turned into, um, it's what all wealthy people say is like you should invest your money, and now people are investing their money, and they're like, wait, you, sh <laughs> you shouldn't have listened to me. Um, so regardless of that, uh, that whole story, uh. I'm having a blast just investing in the stock market. So we've we've like worked up enough capital where like I can pull out the original funds I put in and just have play money. So it's like I'm buying like like Chris has been reading pharmaceutical um stock books, <laughs> like PDFs to like yeah. like there's this one company we're gonna invest in because they make these handheld thermometers that plug into iPhones that we think are gonna take off for COVID stuff. And then they also like so, a couple mask companies before the mask mandate stuff we bought into. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really fun, and it's it's honestly like an not an idle game, but I just keep it on my second screen at work. And it's like, yeah. like today everything was down because the stock market went crazy today because of all this. But it's like in my brain, I'm like, oh, it's gonna go up, and then I'll buy low, and it's, so it, it's really cool. Um, yeah. It's fun. The GME stuff is crazy. Uh, I leave it to smarter people to talk about. I do have the dumbed down uh, Donkey Kong 64 version. It's uh, so good. If people are interested, uh, I can read through this here, which is imagine Donkey Kong 64, the one of the best games ever made. Um, instead of stealing the banana horde, King K. Rule signs a legally binding contract to buy 101 bananas. That's it. He then uses that legally binding uh, guarantee to sell the bananas he'll eventually own to get enough money to afford to build K. Rule Island. However, Cranky Kong realizes that King K. Rule is about to do that. So separately, he actually buys the bananas himself at a much higher price and boosts the price up. So when King K. Rule is legally bound, when the short comes to fruition, he's legally bound the 101 gold bananas despite what price they're at. So what shorters are trying to do is they're trying to short the price so they say, hey, I'll buy those 100 stocks. They lower the stock price. Then they can buy them back and make a profit. And what Reddit is doing is saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to not sell and we're going to kick up the price. So when you're legally obligated to buy these back, you have to do it at a much higher price and yeah. get screwed. Uh, I, just I just thought that um, was funny. Uh, yeah, I, I just think it's funny how you described Robin Hood as an incremental game because... Uh, we talked about this Tuesday evening and uh, Wednesday morning I downloaded Robin Hood and I put some money in and I think I found my new clicker game boys. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Like, 
like you're right it's it's hard to do anything right now because the market's so weird and all yeah. my money is tied up into gamestop and amc stop and robin hood is being an asshole so it's not like i can quickly pull out and buy back etc i'm basically tied into it but it's definitely one of those things where like gamestop is part of this it has absolutely nothing to do with gamestop it, yeah. it could happen it could have picked any other retailer that is in a situation where hedge funds like to manipulate their stock price and somebody says no. Like it has nothing to do with video games. But now that we're looking into it and now that we're investing, we realize it's kind of like a video game. So it's almost full circle for us. So yeah, like I, I've been talking about it for years where I'm like, I should probably start investing because I got savings that's doing nothing. And I think I'm actually going to start doing it. And I think I, I, I think I'm going to do a little bit of day trading and a little bit of long term. Yeah because it is, big... it is kind of fun we do like short-term week week buys on the bill you should join our we're gonna have a discord you join our secret yeah. stonk discord um, i was like i was even like this is this is again please don't take any investing advice for us but i was even looking at stocks today and i was like i noticed they they always go down by like 10 percent when the market opens and then they rebound so what if i just buy when the market opens and then i sell 20 minutes later and i'm gonna 10 percent increase and i'm like i think i'm gonna become like a rapid trader by I'll, accident I'll, honestly i'll send you <laughs> this show is just devolving i'll send you the other discord i'm in that has like great advice uh by trit trit's very good right now uh anyways yeah. um yeah, so Robin Hood been very fun. Okay, let's. Um, you know what? I, I just want to say, I, I do. I just want to have a slight disclaimer. It, it's real money you're playing with. This yes. is not gambling, so don't take any of this as advice. Only... Do a lot of research before you do it. it. Don't don't feel like this is free money. It's your real money you're putting in there. So yeah. we're laughing about this, but don't 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 go throw in all your life yeah, savings. Yeah, only put enough money in money. there that you're willing to lose. I mean, um, like, I, like I said on Twitter, you know, uh, use Animal Crossing as training first. Yeah. You know, play, play around with the stock market and um, yeah, get, yeah, get used to that first before jumping in with actual money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then don't, you don't, you haven't made a profit until you've gotten the money. Until you have the money. Like yes. you having stocks that are worth a lot of money is not your profit not because they could crash yeah. in an instant. Um, yeah. Okay. Time to go to the news that's the new song um guys uh you know what we we talk about games for too long because there's no time for the news uh i'm gonna Sweet. jump straight into this what did you say to me it's great convo also i don't think there's that much no there isn't that much i'm just gonna jump straight into round table uh ian you want to go first yeah i want to talk about uh xbox okay moving so on uh let me just pull up some research talk about here. xbox well i put up the perfect photo i found we're talking about xbox so last friday morning xbox decided that they were essentially going to double the price of xbox live gold in that 12 months would no longer be 60 dollars. it would now be 120 dollars. <laughs> that is a great picture well um i i believe they yeah, so that, that was basically it. So it's one month was going to be $11, three months for $30, or six months for $60. Um, you know, it's it's kind of transparent what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people to move over to Game Pass Ultimate because Game Pass Ultimate is only $15 a month and you get gold included in it. Um, so they're kind of trying to transition their live gold subscribers to Ultimate, Game Pass Ultimate subscribers. A lot of backlash. Uh, a lot of people didn't like this. It's basically a doubling of the price. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like when I was a poor gamer, basically all of high school and all of college, there were definitely times where I couldn't even afford gold. So if I could afford gold, there are, I could definitely see people who can afford gold but couldn't afford Game Pass Ultimate. So it, it seems a bit harsh to try and force them up to the higher price point. What do you guys think? Yeah, I remember same exact deal. Like when I was in high school, um, they had for one of the halos that came out on 360 i can't remember if it was four or whatever um it was like a three month subscription to gold and that was like the perfect amount for me because it was like i could buy it on my birthday or something like that when i had money and it was you know mm -hmm. three months of playing with my friends on, on multiplayer and stuff like that and uh it was great and i think it was 15 dollars or, or or 10 dollars or something like that if you could find it at a discount at walmart or something um yeah. This this jump to 
you know, essentially ten dollars for per month. Um, it's it's a lot, you know, and especially in a pandemic when people are out of work and and you know unemployment so bad and and money is a thing that people can't count on as much as you know we just talked about the stock market and stuff like that. Um, it, it's not the same for everybody. So I think that it was. I, I read a thread on Reddit where it was like you know this this wasn't some decision that was just made offhand like there were discussions there were meetings about this they had marketing materials pushed out to GameStop and and all the other retailers advertising this so this was something that they put research into and it was a I think it was a bad move you know I genuinely I mean they obviously they walked it back you know tw was it less than 24 hours later or something like yeah, that yeah so I'm, I'm looking at a tweet from Aaron Greenberg uh who is the Xbox games marketing at Microsoft um 11.53 p.m. of the day that the announcement went up. So that's like, what, 14 hours later. He says, no changes to Xbox Live Gold pricing. So the price changes are not happening. And also free-to-play games are now free to play. You don't need Xbox Live Gold. Um, so yeah, they, they walked it back. I think it was a bad decision in the first place. I got to give them kudos for walking it back so quickly because, yeah. look, I know... I know at least Will and I, we kind of sound like Xbox fanboys because of just how great the consoles and the Game Pass ecosystem is, but I could definitely see Sony making this mistake and then not walking it back for several months. Yeah. So it's definitely. it's at least good that they recognize the mistake. Um, it's also... And it's, it's kind of, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, I just want to say it's also... You can kind of tell what they're doing is they're trying to make these people be like, oh, gold is a better deal. Let's switch over to gold. But there's better ways to do that than to yeah. raise that like you could easily i mean be like hey you know you can just get what you're doing now but you can have more to it and you pay the same price or like yeah. there's plenty of ways to convince those people even if you can't reach them other than them waking up the next day and being like hey how come the price has doubled this month um like yeah i don't yeah. know why they thought extorting people was a good idea <laughs> Mm -hmm. yes yeah, so i just figured that was that was kind of a, a big blockbuster news story the end of last week but um it's it's good to see that they reacted that the market it's good to see that the market reacted so strongly to it and that they were able to walk it back um and i think the change that basically happened from thursday to saturday is that free-to-play games are now free to play online on xbox so for example apex legends it's a free game to download and play same with rocket league but you had to pay xbox live gold you didn't have to do that on the uh, playstation you don't have to do that on the pc but uh now you have that with the xbox so so at least they threw that in there they probably had it coming anyways but i'm glad they they kind of had that as a mea culpa to immediately offer that so that you know like we said cheapo budget gamers like all of us once were we can now play those free to play games without even having to pay for multiplayer. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Awesome. Uh, Kyle, anything, uh, anything here to your fancy to chat about? Oh yes. Oh yes. KOTOR possibly potentially coming back. Um, although I do take this with a massive big old kosher grain of salt. Um, it is, it comes from uh, the rumor comes from the Besbin bulletin, which is, not the most like trustworthy slash accurate rumor mill uh, out there. Um, granted, Jason Schreier did confirm that he's at least looking into it, but he he doesn't comment on stuff that he hasn't confirmed. Um, and he did say that it was if if it was true, it probably wasn't coming from EA, which I think is interesting um, and also a good thing because. I don't necessarily trust EA with the Star Wars license other than, you know, Fallen Order, which which was really the only solid game that they put out. Battlefront 2, I think, is better than it than it was at launch, uh, which was which was a mess at launch. But the the idea that Code Tour could be coming back in some way, hopefully not in an MMO fashion. Uh, I really don't care for for online always star wars stuff i like i like my stories i like my single player stuff yeah. like my rpg elements and uh the original kotor and the second one i actually played the second one was the first ever kotor game i played so i sort of jumped in and had to do a lot of catching up and backtracking um but it was you know those those games are so near and dear to my heart and uh if they can even come close to the storytelling of the first one and the, and the writing of the second one i think that it'll be something really special 
Yeah. Yeah. I think, sounds... I think something you said about how you're not sure you trust EA right now with the Star Wars game. I think the other side of that is I'm not sure I trust Bioware with any game right now. Yeah. So, so letting somebody else take a crack at KOTOR sounds like the smart move here. And there was... Well, uh, I there think Obsid Obsidian um, had something to do with the second one. Didn't they Didn't they yeah, develop they, the second one? They're the second um, one. I, I loved the second KOTOR game. I mean, maybe it was just a product or, 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 you know, the reason that I love it so much is because it was the first KOTOR game I played. But, like, the writing in it was so, so good. And, yet yeah, it was basically uh, the ending. Like, the last, like, three, four hours was just a mess. And, you know, it was sort of unfinished and they released it. It was kind of like a weird, a weirdly strange parallel to Cyberpunk where it was, like... There were so many elements of the game that were sort of cobbled together at the last minute and they had to change stuff. But I love that game so much. And and yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't trust Bioware with a 10-foot pole. I mean, I I, I think they're they're just such a mess right now. Um, so if if it is coming from someone in Ubisoft, if it's you know something uh one of their premier studios is working on, I think it, it could at least be interesting. Um yeah, so I'm I'm just really interested to see. Yeah, and there was a there's another article I forgot to grab uh, of uh, there is a another rumor more confirmed of a Kotor remaster also in the works. Uh, I believe yeah. that would probably be one and two since they've already upgraded those to like iPad and stuff years ago. I can see. Well, that so let happening. me um let me read from this IGN article. So so first of all. Uh, speculations about the studio. Quote, furthermore, Wushu Studios' Nate Nadja also took to Reset Era in response to this to say, it's not as mysterious as you think, the studio. It's just not a household name most people are aware of. End quote. And, uh, quote, there have been previous rumors of a Star Wars KOTOR re remake being in the works at EA and that it would take elements of the first KOTOR and Knights of the Old Republic 2 and retool the two series to make them fit in current canon. Uh, it is unclear whether this is the discussed project that has been take, since been taken away from EA or if it's an entirely new story. So, gotcha. so that's kind of what you're talking about, Will, where this may be the remake they're talking about. This may not be. It also sounds like the remake may be more than just a um, remaster. Like a, yeah, remaster, that it's going to actually do some retooling. But either way, I've never played the KOTOR games. I'm kind of on the fence as to whether I should hop backwards or try these out. I'm excited to have this series have a fresh start because that seems kind of like with Yakuza Zero. It's like I like those nice entry points into yeah. an established series. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, uh, another quick hit here: Vicarious Visions, makers of the Crash Bandicoot, Ban Pan Bandicoot, Bandicoot uh, remasters, and also the Tony Hawk One Plus Two Equals Three, uh, have merged into Blizzard. Blizzard Entertainment, uh, also known as Activision. Uh, no, owned by Activision. Um, so that happened. And then... Well, just to be clear, when they say merge, etc., Vicarious Visions is already owned by Activision. They basically yeah, dissolved they... Vicarious Visions. You're no yeah. longer a separate studio. All your developers, etc., are, are now going to be part of Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, so yeah, they absorbed it. And then... They also came out that Blizzard dismantled their classic games team, which was the team that made StarCraft 2, the team that made Diablo 3. Um, come on, Bloomberg. Just let me read your articles. Um, and then on top of that, there was another report saying that the Diablo 2 remake is currently in development at a reorganized Blizzard which then cycles back into did they dismantle the classic game team and then pull in Vicarious Visions to take over the Diablo 2 remake uh, and just scrapped their original original team there, which sounds like a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, that Blizzard 1 team, uh, they had, uh, like I said, had been responsible for the Diablo 2 remake and they had done that Warcraft 3 reforged. Um which wasn't mm -hmm. the best received game um, that they did most recently. So it's interesting to see what happens here in the next couple of weeks. If they announce anything, if they're like trying to do this to be at a more stable position, I wonder if something happened that caused this. Like if, if there was a big, uh, like someone wanted Diablo two remade one way, someone wanted it remade the other way. Um, 
it'll be interesting to hear about that stuff once once things settle down yeah. a little bit. Reading through the uh, Bloomberg article by Jason Schreier, which is you know sprinkled throughout with insider information that he's been able to pick up, um, I, I think it's a pretty good assumption that basically the Diablo two remake was with the Blizzard team that did Warcraft three Reforged. That game was not received well. It's the lowest the lowest critic score of any Blizzard game. So they basically did a post mortem. They dismantled that team. And they needed somebody else to pick up the the Diablo 2 remake. And so they bring in Vicarious Visions, who did an incredible job on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. They did an okay job on the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, etc. You know, very experienced devs. Why not have them take over Diablo 2? So basically it sounds like, long story short, Diablo 2 remake, remaster, whatever you want to call it, got into a hot spot and they're bringing in Vicarious Visions people to help them. That's what it sounds like. They're having to yeah. reboot that project. Which is kind of sad on the front that I guess there's no hope for a Tony Hawk underground remaster or a new Tony Hawk game for Vicarious Visions or any of these That's other okay. classic remasters. I mean, it could still be there, but but it won't be from Vicarious Visions anymore. Well, I believe yeah. also they helped with a bu- they helped with a bit of uh, Destiny stuff back when uh, they were still part of Activision as well. Yes. Um, yes. So very but interesting. Hey, Will, yes. Just so we're clear, you can't blame them for Destiny. We talked about this. Yes, it's I know. Bungie's fault. I know. It's Bungie's fault. I know. Okay. I got the tattoo. Sure. Um, it's Bungie's <laughs> fault. It's so good. It says on my thigh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we talked a little bit about Hitman IO Interactive. Uh, uh, it is well known that they are working on a 007 game. Very excited about that. Um in the sense of uh, being able to be offensive towards women. Um, as James Bond... No, I'm just kidding. I don't okay. know. But you always Maybe hear that about... Yeah, you know, those James Bond movies. Maybe we didn't, didn't treat... Yeah. <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, so there will be an all-new digital Bond that is not inspired by a Bond actor. Uh, this is some stuff taken from uh, an article written by The Gamer. Uh, and these uh, little quick hits here were taken by... What's his name? Uh, I have his tweet here somewhere. Nebelian? Is that his name? Is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Nebelian. Uh, one of the, our favorite Twitter analysts. Uh, original story that could be turned into a trilogy. That makes sense to me. I feel like every game developer makes an original story that could possibly be turned into a trilogy. Uh, Tomb Raider. Um, Hitman. I feel like that's just the plan from the get-go. That way you can be like, hey, investors, we could make three of these um so do you think do you think that following sort of in the steps of tomb raider and and a couple other uh remakes of of older generation uh characters are they going to do like a james bond origins like a young james bond sort of thing yeah that's what i'm trying to figure out because i'd be okay with that though yeah i i i mean it's, it would certainly be an interesting take on the character rather than just switching actors and having it be sort of the same basic. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I really enjoy Daniel Craig, especially Casino Royale, I think is one of the best James Bond movies ever. Spectre, not so much. Um, uh, you know, the, the, they, ha- they all have their place, I, I think. Um, yeah. And I think it would be interesting to see a young or an old James Bond, <laughs> like... That's like cool. grizzled James Bond, I think could be pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think like a young, like a like a twelve year old James Bond snapping okay. necks. <laughs> nice topic. Please. Like like young Indiana Jones. Uh, and the other thing, they're they're expected to possibly make a new studio uh, and hire more employees for that. I do. I'm calling it right now uh, that there's going to be a N64 GoldenEye skin for your James there Bond has- character. It has to be. Oh. Like the Mario N64 yeah. skin in Odyssey. Uh, and they already have, stuff like um, that. I don't want to say framework, but they have the precedence for that with Hitman 3 has a lot of different suits. Et yeah. So I can see something good coming out of that. And that's kind of where you have a more charismatic main character to have a good story with. And maybe they'll mm-hmm. have good cutscenes. Question. Um, yes. James, James Bond, you know, related. Do you guys have a favorite James Bond game? Ooh. You know, I'll tell you mine. Mine, mine is 
for multiplayer, mine is Nightfire. And for single player, I actually, this is so weird. I really like Everything or Nothing, which is like the Pierce Brosnan. It, it, it was, it's so weird, but I loved playing the single player of that. But, but Nightfire, we actually interviewed um, back in uh, other video game documentary YouTube channel that shall remain nameless. Uh, we interviewed Wright Bagwell of Outpost Games, who previously had worked um, uh, on Dead Space and everything. And he was actually... Uh, one of the senior developers on Nightfire. Oh. So it was really cool to be able to talk to him about that, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I, I have a copy of Nightfire. I don't think I've ever played it. It's, I mean, single player is fine, but the multiplayer is worth. Yeah, I was, I'm trying um, to, I'm trying to think of James Bond games I have played, and I, other than GoldenEye. Yeah, I've played maybe an hour total of GoldenEye multiplayer at parties and whatever, and then I played, I think, the Nightfire demo. And mm. that's it. Okay. Oh, no, that's not true. I have played about an hour of GoldenEye Source. I believe oh. that's what it's called. Oh. It's the yeah. Source oh, remake I, remember, that was I cool. remember that when that came out. That was, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, we had GoldenEye growing up, so we played a heck of a lot of that. No odd job. You're not allowed to be odd job. Flappers only. Um, Flappers. I was going to look up other James Bond. I know there's that From Russia Would Love game that's actually supposedly pretty good. I like remember seeing that game's cover whenever I went into like a blockbuster or a hometown video in like their video game section. From Russia was love was always there, but we would always go there. Um, I, maybe I should do a video on the history of James Bond games. Do it, girl. You guys, you guys haven't played a lot. I, I that would actually be really fun, wow. and I could probably get right to be interviewed for it. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. We'll do, we'll do a and James think, Bond video. Yeah, and I think there's also a lot of stigma around all of the negative stigma around all the bond games except for golden eye so yeah. it's a lot of like people never touch the other games except for golden eye so it'd be interesting to see the actual yeah. history and games that people are ignoring totally. all right 10 years from now i'll have a i'll have a james <laughs> bond video yeah and there'll be iceland behind the scenes as well yeah um <laughs> next uh let me skip that one for now uh electronic arts creates full circle studio in vancouver to work on everyone's most anticipated game of 2009 knack three knack three skate four make ea skate again everybody yeah okay wait i'm sorry i know look i just have a question for you guys do you guys care about skate no I enjoyed no, no. Skate 3. Yeah, I don't care about it either. I, Tony X better. Yeah. I, I don't really... I didn't grow up with a, a PlayStation, so I didn't really have access to uh, many skateboarding video games in general. So I never got the... I, I never got it. it. It never made sense to me. And I was never good at them whenever I tried them. So it was sort of just completely over yeah. my head. I played a lot of Tony Hawk. I, there was a really good BMX game I used to play where you could play a volcano yeah. monster. Dave Mira's freestyle BMX. Is that the? Is that it? Was there a volcano I monster in it? it. Oh. I couldn't. I didn't have a console. I just had my PC, and somebody gave me a budget copy of Dave Mira. So instead of playing Tony Hawk, I just played a lot. I should drum that up for a stream. Oh, actually, I don't know how to capture an Xbox. Um, but Dave Mira freestyle BMX. Um, Skate Three. I think I have it on my one because it's backwards compatible, but. The only thing I really liked about it is they had an interesting trick system with like, like moving the board. Like the board was attached to like the sticks rather than like face buttons and stuff. So you're actually like yeah. doing tricks with the uh, mm -hmm. stick, and I, I thought that was pretty cool for someone who has no idea how to skateboard. Um, I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, okay, well, uh, moving on. Only a couple more things here. Bio Mutant. A game that has been talked about for a very long time. I feel like I no, I, I feel like talked about a long time ago when yes. it was announced. When it, it was, was like announced two and two years ago? Yeah, it's been Something sitting like yeah. Yeah. it's so long that I, I have a video game wish list on Amazon that, that that it is on and I haven't updated that in a very long time. Um mm -hmm. because I don't allow my family to buy me video games because I'll probably have already bought it. Um it is coming out May 25th, supposedly. Um, I thought it looks really cool. I remember yeah. when they first announced it. I remember, was it two E3s ago? They had another trailer. And even then you were like, they're still working on this? Um, I think it looks cool. I think it'd be a fun time. Something about 
It's almost like now that I've played Monster Hunter, it's like a Palico. You get to play as a Palico. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be and there, fun. There's like giant boss battles in the world and stuff. Now. Yeah. So hopefully they pull it off. I'm not expecting it. I'm not expecting it to be like some crazy world shattering game, but I'm hoping it like fills that niche of like, like almost like a B game, but a little bit above a B game. Um, and that should be fun. And then uh, finally here on my list of lists, we have uh, there's a Tomb Raider and Skull Island anime show shows, separate shows, separate shows in the works. Um, what's, what's Skull Island? I believe uh, um, as in Kong, King Kong Skull Island. Oh. Mm-hmm. It's just I mean, weird that they, that they said Skull Island. Yes, you I know, agree. I it is Kong. also weird they said Skull Kong Island. Skull. I thought it was like something else. Or why wouldn't you like, just say King Kong? Kong. No, like it's already vague enough. Mean, out of Kong Skull Island, the most important recognizable part is clearly Skull Island. Just like is out of Shadow of Mordor. What was it? Shadow of Mordor. Uh... Gosh, what are the names of those games? Middle Earth, Shadow, Shadow of, of War. War. Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War, right? Yeah. They like pulled the words that weren't the most recognizable. <laughs> it's like calling the second Lord of the Rings not the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Just. Yeah, well, we do. Uh, we do know that it is. It is going to be made by Powerhouse Studios, who you know we love. Those guys. They came up with the Castlevania series on Netflix, which is great. Yes, it is um, a good, good show. They are so good at what they do, and I'm not super interested in a Tomb Raider animated series or a you know Kong Skull Island or Skull Island animated series. But I will definitely check them out just because I think Powerhouse is great. Um, <laughs> And I do it's called Skull Island because Kong is no longer there anymore. The movie no, was called Skull the, Island. The island is called Skull Island. Skull. Yeah. No, they, no, but I mean they're calling the anime Skull Island because Kong is no longer there. Oh. I so I so the it, have you seen it, either of you seen the movie? No, yeah, I, I need to. I actually, like, I thought it was really good. Um it was it was fun. It was pulpy and, and fun. Um they introduced a bunch of stuff in the movie, not to spoil anything that I could see them doing an offshoot of and, and just mm-hmm. having, it, having it exist outside of Kong being there. I just don't know how interesting it would be. Um, I'm sure they can find a way to make it interesting, but we'll, we'll see. Why King Kong Godzilla got fight? Monk. Why King Kong got big axe? Questions <laughs> need to be no. answered. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the 2014 Godzilla movie looked fantastic. Story gets real stupid at the end. Boring. Yeah. We all get out. Oh, it's like stupid. transporting a nuclear warhead on the entire missile for some stupid reason. Why would you do that? Go. It's got to be ready to go. Uh, they're like, okay, we're taking the nuke to attract the monsters. Sir, the monsters have the nuke. Oh my God, we need to get the nuke away from them. It's, <laughs> I can't believe we did that. But I yeah, just and the second movie got even stupider, but it at least embraced the pulpy side of it. So this yeah. third movie, it's not going to make any sense. Will just enjoy it. Come on now. No, I'm excited. I literally was watching the trailer and I go, "Oh, there's some reason they're fighting." Then they team up and fight the big bad guy. And literally halfway through the trailer, it shows the other things they fight. And I'm like, "Told you." Yeah, it's gonna happen. So I, also, I how? Say... I'm oh, sorry. My ahead. one complaint. I, Kyle, you're not allowed to talk. My one complaint. <laughs> no, my one complaint with all monster movies, including Pacific Rim, is whenever they fight in the water, they're like standing up, and they're in the middle of the ocean, and that's not how oceans work. Okay, they're in the middle of the ocean. They're in the bay. And second of all, yeah, sure. Let's watch a monster movie where they're just waddling around and they're like swimming up to their necks. That's a great movie. Also, my- Godzilla stands up in the aircraft. Ca- or yeah, well, that's not supporting their weight. My- my complaint is my complaint is the first two Godzilla movies of the, the the new ones starting in 2014, the scale of Godzilla. I was like, they got it right. Like he's like mm, taller yeah. than skyscrapers, or as tall as skyscrapers. Second one, I think it was very much pretty pretty close. Like they were all sort of massive and everything. The trailer to Godzilla versus Kong, Godzilla is noticeably smaller. Like. Like way smaller than he should be, just Baby. so that con- and it, I I think the um, the continuity of scale here is is what bugs me. Yeah. Other thing I do want to bring up though, 
as ridiculous as that trailer was and as stupid as that movie is going to be slash awesome as it's going to be, um, I just want to see big things hit each other. Um, that trailer got over 40 million views. Wow. And it's only been four days. That's more views than the Dune trailer, than the Batman trailer. Our than videos. Almost oh. most of our videos, you know, most of them. Maybe not, not Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> yeah, not Dwarf Fortress. Um, people are like, want this movie. Like, it, it's crazy. And it's it's got 1.3 million likes versus 30 million dislikes. It's it's crazy. It's it's going to be huge. Um, when does it come out? Unintended. Um, end of yeah. March. I think they just and that'll be on it. HBO Max, right? Yeah. Real quick, yes. HBO Max. Look, I love that you're releasing a home, but dear sweet baby bejesus, you need to stop compressing your videos so much, and you need to start offering 4K HDR on your Xbox and PlayStation apps. Because I'm not going to buy an Android TV, and I'm not going to buy an Apple TV just to view non-compressed videos. For sweet bejesus' sake. Anyways. <sighs> um, I'll just end with this. Two things. Number one, Will, you're bringing up a lot of good questions. You guys ever notice that there's sound in space in Star Wars? Like, that's not accurate at all. No, it's stupid. All. It's science it's, fantasy or if whatever. If you want to watch, real talk, if you want to watch The Greatest Godzilla. No, movie, no, you're not allowed to bring oh, this up. It's called Shin Godzilla. Godzilla. Yes, yes. They be Dude, they became a committee at the end. The committee of Godzilla's. Incredible. They're little Incredible. people. They're so dangerous. And then he comes out and he's wearing the suit just like this. And oh, it's no. Incredible. He's a good old man. Oh, we're ending the show. I hate it. I hate incredible. it. I hate Godzilla. I'm starting the music. Folks, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Local Chat. My co hosts, uh, emo guests, are here today Ian Gibson, who's on every episode, and Kyle Bailey joined us. Thank you, Kyle, for joining us. I'm glad your SSD worked today. Um, yeah. That that was solid. That was, I still laugh about that because it was so funny. It's like the chances of that happening it always happen <laughs> to me. I have I I have really really bad luck. So I'm just oh. gonna put it out there. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm I'm more clumsy than bad luck. But other than I that, would... folks, you can tune into our content, subpixelfilms.com. We'll bring you straight to our YouTube channel where you can check out all sorts of great things. Jake just released a video all about No Man's Sky that you can go check out. Kyle put out a video all about how amazing Star Citizen is. Stop the complaining other about the development timeline, please, for the love Stop of God. Stop giving them money. No. It started please in 1832. <laughs> Please feed the algorithm. <laughs> feed it. I mean, go you keep commenting. Just stop complaining. Go, uh, go look at our poll and our post thing that's supposed to pump the algorithm. That'll be fun. Um, what do we got going on this Saturday? We haven't decided what we're doing yet. I was kind of thinking one thing, but I think it might be too scary for Ian. Um, well, so I we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, this song's gonna end soon, so uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on Saturday, or next.